Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Dr. Anirudha Babar uh, from the Department of Political Science and also a coordinator of uh, Dot Talks uh, lecture series. And uh, here we are really happy uh, to present a third speaker in uh, Dr. Ambedkar's lecture series. Uh, the title of the lecture series is The Relevance and Significance of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Today and uh, Tomorrow. So, uh, to continue with the lecture series, uh, we are blessed to have uh, Dr. Yekaterina Dunacheva, Assistant Professor of Political Science from Pasmani Peter Catholic University. And uh, she will be speaking on the case of Dr. Ambedkar Buddhist School in Sayakosa, Hungary, a quest for Roma empowerment. So before we uh, begin, let me just uh, introduce you uh, with our speaker. Uh, Dr. Katrina Dunajeva is an assistant professor of political science at Pasmani Peter Catholic University, a researcher at Central European University Center for Teaching and Learning, and a senior researcher at uh, Public Policy and Management Institute, a wilderness based research and policy analysis center. In addition, Dr. Dunajeva is one of the editors of the Critical Romani Studies journal hosted by CEU's Romani Studies program. She defended her PhD in political science at the University of Oregon, USA in 2014. Throughout her career, Dr. Junajeva acted as a consultant, advisor, researcher, and political analyst for international and local NGOs, think tanks, and other institutions. Uh, Dr. Junajeva acted as an adv advisory board member for Open Society Foundation's Youth Initiative from 2012 to 2014 and a consultant for OSF's Education Support Board 2016. All of her work, both academic and applied, has revolved around the nexus of youth policy, education, and social equality. Dr. Dunajeva's research has been published in several book chapters, peer-reviewed journals, and edited volumes, and her manuscript is soon to be published by CEU Press. Her areas of expertise are Roma identity, education policy, integration, youth empowerment, as well as contemporary Russian and Hungarian politics. Dr. Katya would be uh, speaking on a very interesting uh, topic today. And uh, I think uh, in my quest to understand Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, I, I also reached to Hungary. And uh, I, I really was surprised and happy uh, when I came to know uh, the kind of love and appreciation and also the respect that the Roma people has for Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. And uh, somewhere I realized and uh, drawn the parallels between the situation of the Roma community, that with uh, situation of Dalits in India, the tribals in India, and somewhere there is a common bonding I discovered uh, that, that brings all of us together, uh, Dr. Judduna Jeva, on a single platform. And that bonding is a bonding of suffering bonding of pain and uh, and that is and this is how you know we look at uh, dr uh, br ambedkar's uh, life and his work so uh, dr ambedkar not only influenced uh, all of us is in india but uh, he has influenced the roma struggle for the empowerment and social justice dr ambedkar also inspired the black african movement uh, the the red american movement also so uh, the universalization of uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar uh, is really visible, okay, when you actually visit uh, Hungary and uh, meet uh, the people and the representatives of the Roma community. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to have uh, Dr. Katya, you know, with us. And uh, Madam, I, I really, uh, I'm really thankful to you for your time. And uh, we are really eager to learn from you not only about uh, the case of uh, Dr. Ambedkar Buddhist studies, but really want to know the overall how, the, how Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's life and uh, his work actually influenced uh, the communist of the common uh, member from the Roma community. Madam, over to you. Thank you so much for coming. We are eager to listen to you. Okay. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It is really an honor. Uh, to be here. And I would like to share my screen in a minute. Um, and my presentation will really be structured into two parts. I would like to talk about Roma in general, just assuming that that um, the, the topic or the group 
might uh, not be something that is a common uh, knowledge amongst some of you. So I'd like to introduce the group itself. Um, and then through a case study of uh, a school, um, I would like to highlight how the teachings of Dr. Ambedkar were influential in um, really joining in, uh, of course, with this struggle for rights, but also giving hope to so many students who would have been otherwise lost in the state educational system. So it's a very unique school. Um, and I will, will uh, highlight also the spirituality that is part of the teaching um, or part of the curriculum in the school that gives a very uh, personalized approach to the most marginalized uh, group in Hungary. And with that, actually, the success rate and success stories are quite evident from the school. Okay, so I will share my screen, hopefully, successfully. And please let me know if you see my PowerPoint right now. Uh, yes, yes, uh, it's uh, visible. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, it's coming, yeah. Okay, Okay. Okay, so the school is called Dr. Ambedkar, but it's a Buddhist school, it's a high school, and, and the town is called Shayokaza. Uh, since then, I'll, I'll talk about when it was in Shayokaza, uh, quite recently moved to another town of Mishkwaz, but uh, really the school did not change much. Uh, and a little bit about Roma, just so we have a common understanding, what is the group that this school specifically is, is catering to? So Roma, who are also known as, as gypsies, uh, they came to Hungary in the 13th and 14th centuries, so really a long time ago. And their traditional occupations were horse trading, metalworking, basket waving, craftsmen, they were blacksmiths. Um, this is important to mention because that also made them uh, not only an integral part of the society, but a very much honored and respected masters of society. Um, and that is important to say because uh, on the one hand, it, it, it shows how the history of Roma have been intertwined with the histories of, of the countries where they live in. Um, and that goes, of course, against the narrative that Roma somehow have... Uh, developed historically and their, their identity developed on the margins of society. It was very much part of the societies in which they lived in. And again, they were honored masters in those societies. Um, Romani people uh, from early documents were sometimes mentioned as Egyptians, from which the name gypsies came from. But that was a mistake, as they later on found out, or also the pharaoh's people referring to similarly this misconception that they came from Egypt. But later it was discovered that they actually came from India. Um, some, so it was linguistic evidence that pointed at the roots of Roma to India, specifically the Romani language that shares roots with um, some Indian languages. So then scholars traced it back that uh, Roma actually left North India sometimes between the 6th century and the 11th century and started migrating uh, towards Europe where they settled in various parts of Europe, various countries in Europe. Um, so back to their history a little bit, just to uh, uh, show, you know, what is the context of Roma today. So as I said, they were very much honored um, uh, members of the society. They, they took an important position as masters with skills that were so valuable. Um, and a testament to that actually are those royal grants that were given to them in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, they were under the protection of the crown. Uh, they had freedom to travel. Uh, they had no military obligations, which was quite a privilege. Uh, they did not have to adhere to the to Christianity. So their status was very distinct uh, and I would say privileged from the rest of the population. Um, they were also able to form autonomous ethnic groups. And again, this was the time when consolidation of the state was already underway. So being autonomous at that time was another set of privileges that they enjoyed. Um, and sometimes they could form their own authorities under the leadership of what was known of voivods or voida in Hungarian. Um, I find this very important because when we talk about uh, educating a counter narrative or educating history of the Roma people, which is extremely important in not only for Roma, but also the non-Roma population, this tends to be omitted. Uh, uh, but it goes against, again, the, the dominant narrative now of how Roma have been marginalized for centuries. They, in fact, were not. 
So later on, this is when some of the, these tendencies are changing. Uh, the reasons are really multifold, but from the mid 18th century, um, there is what's called enlightened uh, policies. I will talk about them in, in just a minute. And also with the later um, appearing industrialization uh, um, uh, process, many of these uh, skills that Roma possessed are becoming obsolete. So let's get back to the mid 18th century. This uh, at this time, the policies of Maria Theresa and also her son, uh, Emperor jo Joseph II, um, already treated Roma very differently from from previous um, years. So at this time, there's a very clear civilizing mission that appears in um, Western Hungarian Empire or Habsburg Empire at that time. Uh, also, the state is, is centralized, the nation is being consolidated, and with that, there is a, a, a clear mission of creating citizens out of what they were seen as misfits uh, of the society. So, as I said, these enlightenment policies that were employed by both Maria Theresa and her son Joseph um, were, were treating Roma as... Uh, people or group who are capable of improving and learning, but who ultimately must be changed. And this change was seen as necessary for them to become civilized members of the society. And the reason for their uncivilized nature was their culture. This is how it was seen at this time. So these enlightenment policies uh, if, were introduced with tools such as re-education, forbidding of the use of Romani language. This is a very important uh, phase of Roma history because this is when many were assimilated. So assimilationist policies were in many ways successful because a, a large proportion of the Roma population lost their language. And with their language, a very important part of their identity was lost, not all of them. Um, but again, this, this, this was um, a, a very important campaign in that. Um, another uh, tool or mechanism of this civilizing mission was taking away children for re-education purposes. Um, usually, Romani children were then placed in uh, Hungarian Christian families, uh, peasant families, and they were to be also called New Hungarians. Um, Roma were denied the right to own horses, so that, again, a lifestyle, a traditional lifestyle that they had was forbidden. Um, denied the right to own back wagons so that they, the sedentarization process could start. Um, and also, also, this was a fight against nomadic lifestyle. Um, Roma were issued land and seeds to become uh, liable to pay tribute from their cro crops in order to make them also peasants, um, similarly to their, their non-Roma um, in the country. They were supposed to build houses and had to ask for permission if they wanted to leave their villages. That, again, the, the quest for sedentarization um, and sedentarized lifestyle. Um, and in addition to that, there, there was also a decree to disallow the very term of gypsy or tsigani, um, as they were known at the time. And it was replaced with new terms, new citizen, new farmer or new peasant, new Hungarian, new settler. These were used to describe or to name, to call this group. So the whole eradication of culture was not enough. It was uh, also eradication of the, the whole title or, or the whole label that was used to identify the group. Um, and then uh, along with that, there were also prohibitions uh, in terms of marriages between Roma. So mixed marriages were encouraged. And that was another way, of course, of... Um, assimilation. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, assimilation campaigns were, were successful in many ways because they did achieve that many Roma, for example, did not pass on the language to their societies. Um, and I'm going to skip many uh, phases here of history because we only have an hour and, and a lot to talk about. Um, I just wanted to highlight these two eras for sure in terms of you know Roma playing such a significant role with their skills and then Roma all of a sudden becoming victims of really the philosophy, po political philosophy, uh, societal philosophy of the time and, and all of a sudden uh, being targets of civilizing missions. 
Um, and then later on, they were, uh, according to many accounts, uh, integral, uh, remained integral parts of the Hungarian society. And a testament to that was actually World War I. The picture you see on the top is um, from actually World War I. In many accounts, many historical um, uh, research uh, shows that they served, for example, in the military with the same heroism, with the same patriotism as any other Hungarian. Um, so there was really no antagonism um, to the extent that, that this popular narrative today makes it seem like. The biggest turning point, of course, was World War II. Uh, the, the, this history of World War II in uh, Romani history is known as uh, Paraimos, which also means destruction. Um, and of course, we all know World War II in the context of the Holocaust, and, and now there's significantly more effort uh, being paid into conducting more research into the Roma Holocaust, which is what Paraimos um, means. So how Roma were affected, deported, um, annihilated during World War II. Uh, which was a similar campaign to what the Jewish Holocaust was, but targeted against uh, the Roma. Um, so there were, uh, for example, gypsy cards, identification cards, as they were known. This is the picture that you see on the bottom. Um, that was a way to identify um, where they are. That was before the, the mass deportations were happening. Um, and then later on in Hungary, just like in most other Eastern European countries, uh, when anti-Roma atrocities began, then most Roma were either transported to concentration camps or forced labor camps where a significant part of them um, died. In Hungary, uh, the Aero Cross um, Party assumed power in 1944, and that was a far-right um, Hungarian Nazi party. And under their rule, um, Roma suffered the most. This is when the most intense deportations uh, happened in the country and atrocities within the country. So this is a significant event, and this is something that is a returning um, element of Roma history. And another reason why I'm telling you this is because the school we're about to talk um, in, in a moment uh, highlights uh, the importance of Roma history and Roma identity in their teachings as well. So who are the Roma today is uh, an important question. Um, this is another discussion I, I, I thought to have uh, before we talk about the school. So we see how uh, the teachings of the school uh, are a little bit different from, from what, for example, the Romani identity narrative is for, let's say, uh, even the NGO sector or the, the this common um, in state educational institutions. So I brought a few photos here to show you. This is from an exhibition some years ago. Um, and, and this is a, a very good juxtaposition of what Roma are seen uh, by um, much of the society and who they are in reality. All the people you see here on, on the pictures are quite known um, Romani, either scholars, politicians, or activists. Um, so they're all respectable members of their societies. Um, if, uh, several of them have PhDs. Others are, are um, important political activists and leaders of um, big NGOs. And then you see them in, in their professional outfits. And on the left, you see them how uh, the stereotypical representation um, of of this group would would portray them, so this exhibition was was um, a very important signal, a very important message to the society that these stereotypes, negative stereotypes that many have about Roma as fortune tellers, as you see here, as uh, beggars, as uh, musicians, is really reductionist, and these kind of stereotypes uh, do not allow the Roma minority to really break out of these stereotypes and sh show their true faces. And the true faces, of course, is what you see um, to the right here. So this exhibition had a lot more photos than the ones I'm presenting here to you, but this is just a taste of um, uh, how different the reality can be from the perceptions. Um, so the contemporary situation of Roma is uh, rather difficult um, in Hungary. And this is basically 
to introduce you to the background of the students who are um, who attend the school, Dr. Ambedkar School. Um, so Roma are the known to be the biggest losers of, of transition in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So ever since then, there's really has been quite uh, small, if any, improvements in their life. Um, two indicators of that, that that I'm showing you here on the slide is the labor market participation. You see statistics on Roma uh, compared to non-Roma in Hungarian labor market. So you see that um, unemployment rate is significantly bigger for Roma. Long-term um, unemployment rate is, of course, the, the more serious indicator uh, after which it becomes increasingly more difficult to re-enter uh, the labor market. Inactivity rate is, is extremely high, and you see employment rate, rate is half or less of Roma than non-Roma. This also shows to you that there are structural um, problems that Roma have to face, and they begin as early as early childhood education, continue throughout school, and then um, go on when they want to enter the labor market. With these statistics, of course, this is a very complex um, question, but the statistics speaks for itself in terms of inequalities and what they mean for um, Roma. And in terms of education, this will be more relevant for our discussion here. Um, education levels you see for uh, birth cohorts, so the statistics shows how it changes from one generation to the next. Um, and how it compares to um, the non-Roma population um, in Hungary. So here you see, even though there is an, a, an improvement between the cohorts, so from the 70s to 90s, there is an increase in the attendance, there's still a, a difference between uh, Roma attendance and non-Roma attendance, and there's still significantly less uh, Roma who even uh, complete their elementary education or primary education. And uh, if you see the numbers for already enrolling in higher ed uh, education institutions, enrolling in college, it's uh, the biggest gap, right? I mean, only 4% of Roma enter college colleges as opposed to 31% of uh, their non-Roma peers. So this is something that the school is working towards as well, is to change these numbers to allow more and more Roma to join uh, universities and, and become role models, become really equal members of the society um, like their non-Roma peers. Uh, and in addition to that, of course, is the uh, intolerance, xenophobia that exists, broadly speaking, in Eastern Europe, but very specifically in Hungary as well. Uh, many studies were conducted. Uh, one of the more recent uh, study was done um, about Hungarian attitudes towards minority groups. So they did both a study on Hungary and compared it to the EU median, the average in the European Union. Um, and they did studies about anti-Muslim, anti-Roma and anti-Jewish um, sentiments in the country. And as you see, Hungary excels in all, if uh, I may say that. So Hungary is quite anti-everything. All the major groups that are listed here, Muslims, Roma and Jews, uh, it, the the Hungarian uh, intolerance level of intolerance is is quite higher, sometimes even double than that in the European Union. Um, I brought you one quote here just to illustrate what it looks like in politics. So, co-founder of of Fidesz party, that's the ruling party today in Hungary, Zsolt Bayer, made the following statement in January of two thousand thirteen. A significant part of the Roma are unfit for coexistence. They are not fit to live among people. These Roma are animals and they behave like animals. When they meet with resistance, they commit murder. They're incapable of human communication. Um, so this is quite outspoken, which I, I would say more often it would be an implicit um, language of intolerance. This is quite explicit, as you see. Um, but importantly, many of the policies that are now formulated in the name of integration, in fact, further marginalize and, and push the Roma back into the margins or even beyond the margins of society. 
Um, and in the labor market, we're actually working on, on a study right now in the labor market, it's a similar situation in education. So even uh, 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 the policies that were aimed at integrating Roma or enabling them to receive an education, in fact, or in reality on the ground, s simply meant that many of the Roma children, without really any reasons, were put in special education schools. So their level of education uh, is not going to improve under the conditions and the circumstances that exist today. They are simply kept at the same position. And, and these integration policies, in my opinion, are integration policies just to name. Uh, but in fact, they do not go beyond the structural racism that exists in society today. Um, so just a few words about the distribution of population, some of the characteristics of um, Roma population. So much is disputed. And as you know, these um, uh, even census that is conducted once every decade, um, it's all uh, uh, self um, um, choice. So it, everybody chooses their own identification. And given that many uh, scholars actually argued that Roma would not willingly choose uh, or self-label as Roma. So they, even if they're Roma, they might choose the non-Roma label. Um, so the 2001 census showed two, uh, 205,000 people, uh, Roma people in Hungary, which according to many observers was, was a clear understatement about the number of Roma. After that, an interesting campaign began, which was called We Belong Here. And that was, was, was a campaign that was aimed at strengthening Roma identity and, and uh, instilling pride in Roma in order for them to be more willing to take that box at the census and actually uh, um, own up to being a Roma, be proud of being Roma. And that was relatively successful because you see the difference between the 2001 and 2011 campaign. Um, obviously, it's not impossible for Roma to increase uh, from 205,000 to 315,000. So uh, everybody sees that as a result of, of a little bit of pride that this campaign gave to Roma to um, actually reveal or, or be uh, more open about their ethnic identity. So what that says to us again is, is that there is a very um, pervasive, uh, not only fear, but uh, shame of, uh, of being Roma, which is, again, something that the school will have to go against when they teach, uh, for example, Romani history, that it's not something that um, should be a source of shame. It's something that should be a source, source of pride. Uh, researchers put actually the number at 9 to 10 percent, according to their estimations. Um, it's very difficult to know. There's uh, lots of research into politics of numbers, uh, whose interest it is to lower the numbers or, high, or, or actually um, uh, inflate the numbers. There's much politics going into that, but realistically, uh, what we can rely on is the census. Um, but it, 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 the census does not necessarily show the, the real numbers on the ground, given these exclusionary and racist dynamics in the country. Um, what is known, however, is that it's a very um, young population in terms of its age composition. So about a third are under 18, um, which, which is a significant finding because this also says to us that many of them are young people. Comparatively speaking, in Hungary, the population uh, is declining, uh, the non-Roma population, while the Roma population is growing in terms of their numbers. So this is something that must be considered. This is also something that will illustrate the importance of education, even the higher importance of education, because the fertility rates um, among Roma tend to be higher than among non-Roma. Okay, um, and if just a few more language ethnic labels, just so, uh, and after this, we will start with the school. So, uh, as I said, assimilationist campaigns back under Maria Theresa were quite successful. So many do not speak um, their mother tongue anymore. Uh, the majority just speaks Hungarian, but there are still some who do speak their language. The uh, Lovara, also known sometimes as Block. Uh, Roma have uh, still retained their their um, dialect, 
they are bilingual. Usually they speak their their um, dialect as well as Hungarian. And then there's Boyash um, uh, minority. They uh, tend to reject actually the label of Roma. They prefer to be called Boyash or Boyash Gypsy Bash in Hungarian. They live in the southern part of Hungary. And their language actually resembles an archaic Romanian language because their their uh, migration route actually was from uh, or through Romania. Um, and then uh, there is a so-called standardized Romanes, which I wanted to add here because with the institutionalization of Roma rights, uh, there are now several NGOs that are fighting for um, preservation of Roma history, construction of Roma history, addition of historical knowledge from the Romani perspective. Um, and there is a, a campaign to basically reteach uh, uh, the Romani language to Roma, the language that was either lost or through these efforts of assimilation um, deprived uh, from Roma families. And many call it a standardized Romanes because this language was, was mainly spoken in, in dialects that might have uh, had some differences, but the standardized Romanes language um, is aimed at really uh, a broader Roma population throughout Europe. There are many debates about the label itself, to call them Roma, to call them Gypsy. Um, everybody has a point. Um, the, the politically correct terminology is, is Roma, um, even though I mentioned the Boyash, for example, so Roma in Romani language means person, you know, a Roma person, but Boyash use a different language, so f for them that's, that's an exclusionary language by itself, but we're not going to go there because that is probably not as important for a discussion today. Um, but importantly, uh, there are many efforts at integration, and I'm sure you know this because if anything uh, it comes through about Roma in international media, it's usually in the context of integration, how Roma are being integrated through EU policies, through EU tools and methods and money and all kinds of schemes to national um, uh, measures of, of integration through education, through labor market, but education really stands out. Um, integration, integration through education is something that is usually regarded as really the first step and potentially one of the most important and lasting ways of integrating any uh, group really, but in specific uh, Roma population. Now, uh, in introducing the school, I also want to say that it's very paradoxical to think about integration through education. And if we take the example of Hungary, um, there are many policies, as I said, that are trying to integrate Roma minority um, through education. Uh, on the level of the European Union, very similar. So I brought in um, a quote from you from the Council of Europe's Roma Youth Action Plan. It says, education plays a central role in combating and overcoming anti-Gypsyism because the result of centuries of prejudice cannot be fought by laws and courts alone. Right, so there is a very clear favor of um, education as a tool or re really a field um, of um, education, of, of, of integration. So we might say that education acquired the critical role and responsibility in integrating and in addition to integrating also to empower. But, and this is why I believe this is quite a paradox, educational institutions are segregated and discrimination is still widespread. Um, so, uh, if, from the introduction of my work, you, you, you heard that I've done much, much research about schools. So much of my research was actually going around in schools. These were just very general state schools in Hungary. And through participant observation, just sitting in classes and observing how are Roma treated, are they treated differently? Um, what are the disciplinary measures that are applied to Roma that are not applied to Roma? Is there any change in curriculum that is specific to Roma students? Um, and it was quite obvious that schools are not uh, some kind of microcosm apart from the society, but they're very much representing the societal values. And it happens to be that in Hungary, societal values are anti-Roma, are discriminatory. So uh, most teachers would just echo um, the same sentiments that we see largely present in the society, in the media, in politics, in, in the labor market. Um, it is, in my opinion, quite naive to expect that the schools are somehow going to represent something completely different from, from the societal values. Um, so given that, uh, I made the argument in, in my studies, earlier studies, that 
the the mainstream education is um, just following the same pattern of marginalization in the school. Um, how it manifests was was in in many ways. Um, the disciplinary measures against Roma. So, uh, for example, teachers would would tell Roma that bad behavior is something that they need to keep for their home, implying that you know what is happening in Roma households is by definition bad or something that is worse than what they are allowed to do in the schools. Uh, they would be um, om uh, almost immediately placed in in a weaker group. So even if the class itself is an integrated class with both Roma and non-Roma students. They would be separate groups, uh, you know, a math class for stronger students and a math class for weaker students, and the weaker students all tend to be Roma. So, um, of course, the suspicion arises right away whether that was an, an ethnically motivated separation into groups or uh, did anyone do any kind of, of actual um, assessment of their abilities. So, and we can go on and on, you know, it's not only disciplinary measures, it's not only within class segregation, it's a lot more the dynamics that is going on and the attitudes and the assistance or lack of assistance that they receive. So um, it is it is quite a controversial issue. It's quite a paradox. The map actually I wanted to show you here on the right shows the concentration of Roma students in Hungary. So this map is divided into Hungarian counties. And the more Roma there are in schools in the given county, the darker that county is. And the red ones are where the concentration is the biggest. So you see a segregational picture here. Now it's not showing specific schools, but it shows you that regionally, this is quite visible. You have some places, some counties where there are very few Roma and you have some where there's lots of Roma to the extent that a third of all students are Roma. And a third, Hungary, uh, I mean, Roma are not a third of the whole population. So there is, call, I mean, somebody might call it, it's not segregation, it's a concentration, whatever we prefer to call it, there is a concentrated number of Roma. Uh, and within schools, this tends to be the same thing. There are some schools with Roma, there are some schools with no Roma whatsoever. There are some integrated schools, but again, you know, I, I would argue that even there, the majority of them will have some kind of in, in class or inside segregation. So given this picture, now let's look uh, at, at this school, the um, Buddha school in, in, it used to be in Shayokaza, now it's in Mishkoetz. Um, so the question, so this, this was a study that, that we conducted in, uh, through fieldwork in 2015 with Patrick Chesky. Uh, we co-published an article based on that. And then um, I, I've been following really the school and, and how, what changed, how it changed. Um, as I said, they moved from Shayokaza to Mishkoetz. Mishkoetz is very close to Shayokaza. It's a bigger city and that gave an opportunity for um, students from nearby area to all come to Mishkoetz. And I'll talk about it. They also opened a dormitory, which made it uh, a lot more accessible really for a lot of students. So we wanted to, to ask a question and see what kind of education is most appropriate for marginalized Roma youth. Um, most of whom live in impoverished, segregated and ghetto-like communities. Um, and we were looking for, for not necessarily alternative education, but really a, a model, an educational model that would work for uh, who Roma are and that would work as a, an inclusive space, a community development, uh, developing uh, uh, um, uh, ground for Roma because all of this were needed. So we found Dr. Uh, Ambedkar's Buddhist school in Shoyokaza and, and we went there for, for field work. Um, the pictures you saw are, are uh, my picture that, that I took when we were there. But again, the building itself um, is, is no longer the schools. They moved to Mishkoetz, but um, it is similar. So let's, let's see how education is, is different here and, and what is the mission of the school. So the educated, educational structure uh, uh, we found to be quite progressive and innovative and a lot more... Um, 
catering to a specific group of population that might need a little bit more than the black and white curriculum and um, you know the the same kind of uh, Prussian education style that is dominant in Hungary. So we called it a counter hegemonic and pedagogical vanguard for Roma youth. And maybe I don't know if 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 it sounds something. Uh, is strange, but in fact, uh, counter hegemonic was was uh, quite visible because they went against this narrative that I've been implying throughout my my presentation here that there is this perception of Roma uh, as being oppressed, as being marginal, as being work shy, and um, as being underachieving achievers in school. So. Uh, counter hegemonic discourse that that were narrative or even teachings that they represent in fact are turning that around and saying the opposite they're not work shy they can do a lot of things uh, it's it's there's lots to be proud of uh, when it comes to um, Roma identity so uh, incorporating that into their pedagogy is a, a very important empowering mechanism. And now they also recognize and realize that without giving this, this kind of attitude to their students, their Roma students, uh, education will not be as effective. So this was very much a must in, in, in how they approach education. So the school's attempt to claim a space and reclaim teachings on and for Roma identity was very important. So they're not, they're teaching for Roma identity to strengthen it, but they also teach uh, about Roma identity to give that pride back to the students. So they blend the cultural elements with Dr. Ambedkar's humanist ideology and Buddhist teachings. And that is a very unique combination of things, really. Um, so again, you know, on the bottom, you see these elements being blended um, within the school. You see, for example, on the left, the wheel, uh, some Buddhist elements. Uh, you see Dr. Ambedkar's uh, bust here. So lots of even about the decoration of the school. Uh, gives that that ambiance. Um, so how how are the the cultural elements, for example, included? So it can be the Roma flag. I actually showed you a picture if, if you remember where the flag was there. The wheel in the middle of the flag. You see that is also present there. Uh, Roma anthem, Roma history, some of the holidays that are now celebrated at least um, in Europe, but probably potentially globally, like August second, which is known as International Romani Holocaust Day. May 16th is Roman Resistance Day um, and, and others. And I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, and let me get to the spirituality, which, which I think might be more of an interest for, for um, the guests here. So the founders of the school are Derda um, Tibor and Orso Sianos. Um, we interviewed both of them. I wanted to actually quote uh, an interview from, from um, Janos. He said, after I traveled to India for five weeks, it was a real life changing experience. There I saw that the Dalits, based on Dr. Ambedkar's teachings, take full ownership of their fates and place education in the center. The strong spiritual standing allowed for astonishing changes in the life of Dalits and empowerment of the group. The belief that it is not one's skin color or ethnicity that determines their abilities, but the hard work and effort. So in other words, this very nicely seeps into this counter hegemonic educational mechanisms or, or tools that they're using. Uh, not highlighting. So uh, we found actually that it's a very interesting dynamic here too. While they're teaching about Roma identity and find that important, they also uh, stress the fact that it is not the Roma or non-Roma identity. It's not the skin color. It's not an ethnic label or any of that that will determine somebody's fate. Because they found that oftentimes students would come and they're already broken down by these societal uh, prejudices. You know, they, they don't expect much from themselves, basically. But the lack of expectations towards themselves actually is coming as a result of societal messages that they're getting. So, so this kind of belief or this attitude uh, immediately positions them in a new field in which they can begin hoping, they can begin aspiring towards something. And this is why they thought that education on and by itself is not as meaningful, because if one expects a, a future of joining public work scheme, 
like uh, sweet uh, street uh, sleepers or uh, cutting bushes along the road. Those those are very common, actually, in the popular belief jobs that Roma take. Um, then why would you value education? Now, if you have aspirations to become a doctor or a lawyer, then you will view education differently. So this is why the spiritual ethos is uh, was so important and, and, and so revolutionary, really, for the context of Roma students. Uh, so this philosophy became an essential ten tenet for Dr. Ambedkar's uh, Buddhist school. The goal of the school was to provide useful knowledge, useful to become conscious citizen, to be proud of Roma, of Roma identity, and learn to navigate in the discriminatory system, rather than blindly teach standardized curriculum. So that's another part of, of this flexibility that they allow to themselves. And whereas many uh, schools will teach for, I would say, teaching sake, uh, just because it's part of the curriculum and it needs to be done, they realize that teaching has to be done in the interest of the individual to make them a proud person, whoever they are, to make them a conscious citizen, to make them a successful person, really. So if it, if, if it means navigation through this discriminatory system, that, that, that is what they need to prepare students for. Um, Buddhism and Dr. Ambedkar's teaching are the block, uh, backbone of the school spirituality. It is with this spirituality that the youth is inspired to dream, to think about their place in this world and their ability to shape their own future. And I want to stress how important it is. And actually, in my next slide, I also talk about it. Uh, in my research to outside of the school, this was very common. Before uh, uh, Roma ch children went to school, uh, I would ask around what they wanted to be. And just like any other child, really, girls wanted to be ballerinas, boys wanted to be firefighters, they wanted to be policemen, some wanted to be engineers. And then the same question you ask of fifth graders, and it's usually, you know, shrugging their sh uh, shoulders, they don't know, maybe nothing. So a uh, huge impact what the school years do. And if there's not this hope that the school system can somehow uh, instill in the children that they can do, that they're able to do, then the result will be that these uh, um, pre prejudice and, and discriminatory messages get to them and really destroy all that hope. And then they become the stereotypes that the society sees. So this school really is doing it differently. Um, so spirituality is more central here than, than ethnic-based group identity, which distinguishes the philosophy of Dr. Ambedkar Buddhist School from several Yoma, uh, Roma youth programs. Um, those tend to emphasize pride in Roma culture, transborder and ethnic I I unity, and a certain form of Roma nationalism. And this, uh, I mean, I don't, I can go into this a little more if we have time in the Q and A session. But uh, I find it important to distinguish the two because here, this 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 hope comes. Uh, from the spiritual standpoint, rather than a lot of the Roma youth programs that exist today, which many observers, many uh, scholars actually see as very political. So there, there is more of a political motivation or, or mobilizing the youth to fight for Roma rights. And, and you know, no normative message there, so I'm not saying it's good or bad, but with the school, it's less about this political mobilization as it is about empowerment, giving hope, um, and, or as, as Derdak said, one of the, the, the other founders, our approach is not nationality uh, or identity, and later on he says it's really the spirituality. Uh, the school is unique in many other ways. They, for example, um, plan collaborations. They have trips and contacts with non-Roma schools, universities, and communities in Hungary and beyond. Um, and this is very interesting because one would not expect the school, especially when it was in Shoyokaza, which is a very small town, um, the immediate question we had is, is how come uh, a, a school like this would have such exchange programs? Uh, and the response from Orshosh was, we're all Buddhists. So this spirituality also allows these bonds to be formed. So schools, and when we were there, for example, students were telling us about a trip to Austria, which many disadvantaged students, they don't leave their town, let alone their country. Um, and this exchange program was not based on a disadvantaged school with poor Roma going to Austria. It was between like-minded schools, Buddhist schools in this instance. So there was no label attached to the students, which is something that they experience all the time. Um, so these trips were a very important motivating factor because students meet their peers and they don't look at them as dirty gypsies. They don't have this label of being gypsies. Um, and so they meet on par, on equal 
equal level with, with other young people, um, and they see different models of youth development. It's a very empowering, enriching trip and, and really collaborative ties that they have. Um, they have small classrooms, which actually is, is a result of various uh, reasons. Uh, so, for example, in 2020, there were six seniors, so six people who received their high school diploma. Uh, part of it is because the Hungarian education um, now only requires uh, uh, youth uh, up to 16 to mandatorily participate in the education system. So after 16, many people tend to be tempted, really, to join um, the labor market and start making money. And for Rome, it tends to be the public work program, which again, according to many studies, is, is really reconserving um, the, the marginalized uh, existence that they have. So there's really few skills and, and definitely no opportunities to develop within that, um, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a career, within that uh, work engagement. Most of them, if not all of them, are first generation high school students. So they are the role models. Uh, they don't have role models themselves, so that's another challenge that they have. Uh, I mentioned the dormitory was open since 2018 in Mishkoitz. It's free for students. It also provides meals for students, which is a huge difference for so many of them. Um, and actually, during the pandemic, this is precisely what allowed for so, so many students to um, successfully go through uh, their education, because otherwise, uh, without the structure, this this pedagogical structure that the um, dormitories allowed, they wouldn't be able to finish. Uh, flexibility in their curriculum is something that sets them apart from from all the other schools. Um, so they really focus on the interest of students. That is the most important: the development and empowerment of students. Um, and they recognize that in order to focus on the development of the student, they have to mitigate two factors. One is the poor elementary education that students receive because they come from uh, schools, as I described to you, very commonly segregated. Um, and, 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 and also a lot of their family backgrounds are deprived. Um, so students here learn useful knowledge that raises their self-esteem, help with coping, um, uh, developing coping mechanism in their socioeconomic environment. Um, it allows for students to construct a sense of self, which is uh, quite unique. Um, and it has adjusted curriculum in order to ensure a degree of accomplishment for everyone. Um, and one of them, uh, you know, the sense of accomplishment and also the flexibility I want to highlight is, for example, a child care room. We visited this child care room um, and it was such a big contrast because, you know, in my earlier visits, uh, in every one potentially, I heard about the problem of Roma girls having children early. So this was always in the context of a problem. This is something that the school thought was detrimental. And in this school, not only that it was detrimental, it was seen as, as normal, where it was not frowned upon, it was not judged. If somebody had a child, they could bring the child in into the child care room, and the child was there uh, receiving child care, receiving you know, all, all they needed um, while their parent was in the school studying. So uh, this mentality is, is uh, really worlds apart from, from what I saw in, in the other schools, in these mainstream schools, um, which allowed to students uh, to really focus on their development, on their education, and not see the two as mutually exclusive. Just because somebody has a child in their late teenage years, um, it was not seen as uh, their uh, inability to really go through their education. And it really was just a little adjustment in terms of adding a childcare room into the school. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little fast so that we can go through it. And here we are in conclusion. So the school represents a, a really big shift in pedagogy in many ways. I mean, one is inclusion of the spiritual component. Usually schools do not have any spirituality. Um, and with that, they really lose out on focusing on the students' self-development, on, on, on their emotional well-being, uh, which is such an important prerequisite uh, in order for them to succeed in, in the education system. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, mentioned the, the teachings of, of Dr. Ambedkar and, and, and Buddhist elements of the school that uh, were so important in providing hope 
in the context of poverty and marginalization and discrimination that uh, many of the students face in their everyday um, life. Um, and uh, as I said, hope hope was very important. So talking to students, they many of them felt empowered. Many of them go through the education and apply to universities, and many of them actually successfully get in. Uh, it is very small classes. So yes, we're talking about six students in a year, but it still is quite a difference for that community. Um, and in addition to that, they really do uh, quite an important work in um, buttressing and strengthening uh, their identity. And I put it here, and actually both founders talked about it, their identity as Roma, their identity as Hungarian, their identity as European, because it's not, again, going back to that quote, it's not about the skin color, it's about what they're able to do. And in order to really get to that part of enabling them, there are all these uh, spiritual, flexible curriculum, all these elements that the school is able to provide for these students. Um, and I actually included the trailer. I don't have to show it, but I, I, I can. Um, it was a documentary that was made about the school. Uh, it's called Angry Buddha. Uh, it was made in 2016. So, um, I mean, I can show the trailer if it's of each interest, but I can also send you the link and we can open it for a short uh, question and answer session, whichever is the preference. Oh, well, uh, if it is possible, we can see it right now. Can, yes, you, can you show sure. it? Sure. Yes, yeah, I please, will. please do that. Please do that. Do you see the video? Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Yes. Okay, it, it will coming. be with English subtitles. Hey, Kayaka, it got stuck. I guess there is some connectivity issue. Okay, this is it. But the movie is, is actually available online for everyone. Okay. All right, so I think I uh, stop presenting. Stop presenting. Okay, that was my presentation. So um, I see we're at time now, but I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Uh, first of all, uh, before I open the stage for the question and answer session, let me just congratulate you for enlightening us. I mean, it is really, uh, it was really a good session. Uh, see, because uh, first of all, uh, let me just uh, you know share with you that people are not at all aware about who the Romas are, right? And uh, when they speak about the word gypsy, 
see the gypsy has been highly romanticized uh, uh, concept right but if you go to reality the social reality of the gypsies who are known who are basically romas right a gypsy is a derogatory term which is being used uh, you to identify the romas so that uh, the social reality the political reality their uh, political persecution and also the religious persecution uh, has lot to tell us the history is uh, uh, very uh, disturbing i should say but uh, when people like you uh, and uh, the people who are running dr ambedkar school when they come up and uh, share their stories you know we we get to learn a lot right so in this context uh, i really congratulate you and uh, i open this uh, platform for the questions uh, so if there is any question uh, we can take up okay uh, before uh, any question come let me ask you one question uh, my question is uh, you know the romas are not only concentrated in hungary you know i have uh, some of my friends also and uh, I, i i learned a lot from them about the roma culture and all so uh, i i realized that there are around 10 to 12 million of romas okay the population is basically worldwide okay uh, in europe uh so uh, my question is that uh, what is the situation of uh, roma in europe okay because we have been talking about the hungary right so how does uh, uh the roma who are scattered uh, all over the europe they perceived their own social identity uh, their political identity uh, what do they think about themselves and what the european world the country is wherein they are living think about them can you please enlighten us Mm-hmm. Well, it's a complex question, and it's it's really difficult to generalize for all of Europe because uh, each country might have their own particularities. And um, you know, the literature actually points out to Spain sometimes as the success story. Um, but I would say in, in Eastern Europe, uh, Roma are discriminated everywhere. Uh, the question is in what form and shape the, this discrimination manifests. um what are the possibilities how different the possibilities are between these countries i mean in terms of education i really have done most of my work in education uh, segregationist tendencies are present everywhere in all of european countries um i would distinguish maybe somewhat eastern and western european dynamics because in western europe some of the roma are migrants so they're coming from eastern europe and that just adds a, a different kind of dam- dynamic to their exclusion because it's not local roma as they are here but it's the eastern european roma so it really blends a lot with the you know late late latest um prejudice against eastern europeans coming to western europe and then in addition to that you know uh, the roma and the anti roma sentiment so i would say in eastern europe there's there's uh, you know all countries are really struggling with with um this situation uh, roma are struggling being in this situation um and maybe i would say the the biggest development in the last potentially decade but really the last five years are the ngos but that's also controversial because uh, some say that even though there are more and more ngos do they really reach out to the lowest segments of society do they really make a change to um the everyday life of the you know the roma people in in villages in hungary or in slovakia or czech republic really anywhere um i i personally really appreciate these bottom up um initiatives like dr ambedkar school because um it's local and and because roma so diverse and i tried to show you the different languages that are spoken different you know group labels um all this makes it increasingly difficult to have a policy and so many countries will have national policies for roma but roma is such a diverse group by themselves so um i really like you know these these really small scale initiatives that that in my opinion can can make the most lasting change but i think the two are happening in parallel so while there are these local initiatives that are working great there's also more top down um initiatives led by ngos um which which are at a grander scale really they are the ones who are constructing a new narrative about roma they're the ones who are uh, writing and publishing let's say textbooks about roma language roman as this what i call uh, standardized roman so they're they're doing in you know my opinion from from the research that i'm doing a little bit of of a similar nation building 
than what many European countries have gone through very early on in you know, nation building and state building history. Uh, now we are at a different stage of really NGOs taking that role for Roma and, and going through the same uh, uh, steps, you know, the flag, the anthem, the textbooks, the language, the standardization of the language, um, writing of national history. Uh, so it's a very interesting and exciting process. Um, it's just a question of how it will help Roma who are marginalized everywhere in Europe. And I don't have a question to that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That is, that is very true. And uh, that is important as well. Uh, my next question to you would be in the context of the Hungary, uh, Hungary's constitutional law, uh, whether uh, the Roma people, you know, the members of the Roma community have been safeguarded by the constitution of Hungary? Are there safeguards provided by the Hungarian constitution the way we have in India for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes? I'm sure you are aware of it. You're aware of it, right? So uh, are these kinds of safeguards, the social safeguards are available in the, the constitution of Hungary to secure uh, the social justice, basically, for the Roma people? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. And I will admit my uh, lack of competence to answer legal questions. Uh, I would say that Hungary does have to abide by the human rights regulations. So uh, they need to be provided. And, th uh, you know, the, I know that scholarship in various uh, fields of, of uh, injustice uh, against Roma, I mean, even international um, agreements uh, have to provide, for example, clean living environments. So we did a study on that, and Roma tend to be uh, highly discriminated when it comes to clean living environments. So um, they tend to live near uh, dumping sites, and that is a violation of their human rights, of their right to clean environment to live in, of clean air to breathe. Um, so I would say that, yes, safeguards do exist both on national level and definitely on international level. Uh, but it's just not enough because they're not protected. And because, uh, I mean, there are organizations that are also uh, into legal protection of Roma. Um, and the very fact that they are extremely busy with cases is also an indication that, that their rights are being violated against um, uh, existing legal structures. Um, it also shows that uh, sometimes they don't have the adequate knowledge to really stand up for their rights, and that's very understandable. Um, and in many instances, you know, th these uh, really vulnerable positions do not allow. I mean, even when, uh, you know, we did the study on, on dumping sites and Roma living nearby, it, it tends to be, again, another paradox because some of them make a living out of the garbage that is dumped there. So... It's both their livelihood that they depend on and also the very source of, of their, you know, very low health standards and, and all kinds of issues. So, and it's a clear discrimination because their rights are violated to a clean environment. Um, so it, I, I think once we get down to reality, the situation is becoming so complex because if you ask some of them, they will say, but I need this. This, this is my survival. I you know, collect garbage here and then I sell it or I make something out of it or I burn it and then this is my heating source. Um, but at the same time, we understand that this is this is really discriminatory. This is really not the way to go. So I'm sorry I didn't answer really your question fully, but um, I just... No, it's, it's, it's perfectly understandable. And that is really uh, disgusting if I, if I really uh, want to express myself openly that people are living nearby the garbage. I watched uh, one documentary which was shot in Moldova you know, the, that recorded, uh, you know, the ghettos of uh, the Roma population, right? And uh, and then I recalled the uh, word of uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar when he was uh, uh, trying to contextualize the caste system. He said that caste system is like a, is like a tall building uh, uh, which does not have staircases, right? So if mm. you are born in the lower caste, you have to live in the lower caste and you have to die there. Right. So somewhere, uh, as I said in the beginning itself, that, uh, uh, you know, when I was uh, on the quest to discover Ambedkar, I, I, I came to realize that there are so many parallels that can be drawn from the situation of the Roma population, the Red Indian population, the African American population, the Indian, uh, you know, the scheduled caste, the Dalit population, the tribal population in India. And somewhere I realized the common factor that can bring people together is number one, the the, 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 you know, their suffering. And the second is uh, the hope, 
right? As Dr. Ambedkar School uh, of yours, right? Uh, which is uh, actually uh, injecting in the young minds. And I think uh, the hope can really do miracles. So please tell us about some uh, interesting, uh, uh, you know, the cases or success stories from Dr. Ambedkar School. If you know any, we will be happy to listen to them. Um, they actually are published uh, occasionally in the Hungarian newspapers, which is uh, uh, quite a pleasant surprise. Uh, I looked actually at them right before my, my presentation to see if there's anything new. But uh, I mean, the success stories re really revolve around life stories of these students. Um, and usually these life stories, uh, you know, some of the interviewed students would talk about their family backgrounds. So uh, one student talked about their father who uh, you know was in prison when when he was still a small child and he was raised by a single mother with many siblings and um it's a success story in that you know after very poor education in elementary school they, they he joined this high school and and reinvented himself really uh, i mean these are all inspirational stories in a way that that uh, imagining oneself in this extremely deprived emotionally deprived, financially deprived, socially deprived household um, outside of their own fault. I mean, they were just born there. Um, and then going through a school system, again, without much assistance, because, you know, potentially some of the parents uh, or one parent who is available is not able to assist. If they're working parent, you know, they definitely don't even have time to assist with the studies. Um, and then in that very tender age of early um, um, uh, teenage years, they join a community in which, you know, then they would describe they had friends for the first time. They had peers who understood where they were coming from. They had expectations that uh, were matching their abilities. They had a sense of accomplishment, which they never did. Um, and, you know, that's another thing that, that I also saw in the school, you know, the more you tell somebody that they're inadequate, then they will believe that they're inadequate. So this this internalization of these stereotypes is a very real thing. Um, and here it got reversed, you know, from going uh, from going in, from an environment in which you hear that, you know, you won't do much. You'll probably be a public worker anyways. You'll sweep the streets, you know, don't even bother with homework, that kind of messages to going to a place where they hear you can be whatever you want to. That is revolutionary. And, and just, you know, going through these stories and really they're very diverse. So. Uh, this boy's story stuck with me. This is all, by the way, from reports that were written by the school to um, another girl who was talking about an abusive household in which she grew up in and, and, and her mom and her, you know, two women, basically a young girl and a young woman um, went into a women's shelter. And so she went through her elementary school. Uh, living in a women's shelter. And then, you know, for her, the biggest change was the dormitory. She found some independence. She found some self-esteem that she didn't have before. Um, and very similarly, you know, she, 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 she reinvented herself as an independent human being um, in this environment. And that all gave her such a big push towards wanting different things towards even recognizing that she has opportunities to study and she has opportunities to become who she wanted to. Um, and I think, you know, the boy probably went as an engineer, but I don't remember what school. They both went to universities. And I think the uh, girl went to a, an economics um, college. But, you know, regardless of the paths that they chose, I think this the story of, of personal growth is the one that really sticks and not many schools if any schools really can pride themselves in providing that kind of um, environment for the self-growth self-esteem development um, as the school and and this is how they're making real uh, difference in in lives of these students yeah absolutely that is true uh, i mean such a transformation is taking place and we must really uh, value it. After all, these are the children who are going to create a new world for tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, dear friends, uh, do you have any, any question uh, for Katya? I mean, she will be eager to answer you. Any, any question, uh, you know? No question? Okay. Well, it's maybe, been a pleasure. Yeah, maybe people are still... Uh, Sir, I have... I want yes, to. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. I want to inquire something. I was just like typing the message, uh, trying to ask in the chat section. Uh, so since time is 
open for um, question. So yeah, it's uh, for me, it's my first time hearing about, you know, seeing Ambedkar and Hungary together. So towards the beginning of your presentation, you gave a very in-depth description of the Roma community there. So it was a very uh, enlightening and eye-opening for me. And secondly, um, yeah, as I mentioned, since I'm quite new to this, so I'll just want to hear your take on this and correct me if I'm wrong. So, ma'am, from your presentation, I, I, I could, uh, I, think I could get that uh, the schools, right? This Ambedkar Buddhist schools, they stress on spirituality and identity, identity in the form of. Um, uh, looking at themselves in a very positive light, right? More like in self-empowerment. So my uh, my query is uh, related to the yeah political and social identity that Sir also mentioned, you know? So I just want to know your view, like, can, you know, the spiritual side of them viewing at life, right? Or these identities uh, act as a hindrance in them, asserting their political rights because, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> do you think that can be responsible or it is not? Because when uh, looking into some other minority community, I also did a study on minority community in the northeastern region of India. So uh, here, in, so the focus of that community is more inclined towards religion as compared to the political aspect, you know. So I was just thinking, because when we say about asserting political rights, right, it, uh, it is a bit closer to being violent, right? Uh, like, yes, we know <laughs> Gandhiji and uh, all this uh, and the uh, nonviolent effort, but I'm just talking here in general and no, and uh, yeah. So uh, can it be, yeah, because the focus of this school, can it also act uh, as a hindrance towards, you know, asserting political rights and all this? So I just want to understand your view on this one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a good question and a complex one too. Uh, I think, yes, uh, in my slides, what mm -hmm. I was trying to apply at is that Dr. Ambedkar's uh, schools primary purpose is not uh, political mobilization, but I think it does a lot of work that is prerequisite for a successful political mm -hmm. mobilization, whereas some other um, programs, especially those okay. by those pro-Roma NGOs, have that as the primary goal. It mm -hmm. is quite visible in terms of yeah, their, their um, but it's not, these are not schools, these are programs. So it would be like scholarship programs or workshops being organized. Mm -hmm. So their, you know, p political nature of it is mm. more, not only explicit, but but more of a primary here. Mm -hmm. But here, I think the assumption is that once somebody's self-esteem and, and, and really education grows, mm. then by definition, they will be able yes. to understand their rights better. And so yes. the question about the rights was good because, mm. yes, many don't know. They, they don't. Mm what their mm. rights are. When are the rights violated? Mm -hmm. You have to have a very basic legal uh, training mm. uh, to understand even the Constitution, to know, well, my constitutional mm. rights were violated. Mm -hmm. This is not something to hear very commonly. Mm -hmm. So with education, that awareness grows. And with that awareness, yes. there's a more like, mm -hmm. it will be more politically uh, aware. Mm -hmm. of okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Uh uh, yes, uh, Katya, I mean, uh, really, I just want to intervene. And it's absolutely correct, because uh, here I want to quote uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar once again. Uh, while delivering a message to the students uh, in one of uh, the congregation, he's, he, he's, he spoke about the uh, educate, uh, agitate, and organize. This is a very complicated uh, term, the educate, agitate, and organize. And this is a personalized message that has been given by Dr. Ambedkar to the students. And he was referring to that, that, you know, education is necessary. You want to talk about transformation. You want to talk about revolution. You talk, want to talk about the change, you know, and for that education is necessary. And your self struggle, your individual struggle is also part, plays an important role. And once you go through all that thing, then the organization comes, then the movement comes, then, and this is what we learn from the life of Dr. Uh, B.R. Ambedkar as well. And I think uh, this question, 
needs to be taken uh, into this uh, context also. And another thing is uh, that uh, this is what I've been learned from the history that the grand social movement that uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar has initiated was a bloodless movement. Not a single drop of blood was shed in that movement. And uh, there was uh, one uh, Cambridge scholar, uh, I forgot his name, he stated that uh, his movement was very close to the movement of the Moses, you know, <laughs> who actually took the people uh, from the persecution. And that is why uh, Ambedkar was, uh, is, is called as the modern Moses, you know. So in this context, we can uh, really see that. And uh, spiritual values, uh, spiritual uh, values did not be taken in a, in a narrow sense, I should say whether it is uh, Buddhist spiritual values or Christian spiritual values, because ultimately we need to be a man who could lead further to the society. So Dr. Ambedkar was imagine a society which would be led by the leaders from the ground, you know, and I think uh, this is the concept of, uh, you know, Ambedkar school as well, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Yeah. Uh, Kathy, you want to say something about it? I just want to agree with you. I mean, I think you said it all really well, and um, I don't want to further comment. <laughs> uh, well, then, uh, then if there is no any other question, then I really thank you once again for your time. For the opportunity. And uh, we, will, we will keep in touch. Maybe together we can organize more programs, and uh, maybe sure. we can take up more programs on uh, the issues of the Romas and... Uh, of course, uh, many more people can be invited, your friends and in your circle. Uh, so at the end, uh, I can tell you that uh, the voice of the oppressed is one, you know, and uh, when we are together, we can actually together make this world a better place. So with this positive note, I conclude yes. this program. So Katya, thank you so much for your time. Thank and you your for knowledge. inviting me. Thank you. Have a, have, a, have a good day. Have a good day. You too. And thank you, uh, all of you, for participating. Thank you so much. We'll meet again.